Good morning, everyone. Good to be back with you. Um, for those of you who don't know or haven't been here in the last week or so, I was gone last week. I was on a kind of a mini vacation. I took a few of the time, few days of that time, to go on a, uh, I guess I would call a retreat, to a very good friend of mine, friend of mine's home, which is a farm, way over in Farmington, up on a hill. I had a chance to just relax and listen to birds and watch bees pollinate and saw some deer and listened to some beautiful... I saw a big hawk, too, big hawk, come and land in a tree right beside me. So I've come back nice and relaxed. Can't you tell? Feel pretty good? I hope you're all feeling relaxed today as we continue into uh, the month of May, which is kind of slowly slipping away. Um, I want to especially thank uh, Karen, my good friend Karen Janice, for filling in for me while I was away. She always does an excellent job, and I have a lot of confidence that she will always do a wonderful job leading worship. Um, so again, thank you to Karen Janice. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. I know we're going to have the warrant read. Um, are we going to have the warrant read? Because we do have... A, a meeting today after church, so <clears throat> so this is the third and final reading of the um, warrant for the annual meeting held directly after church today. Uh, Article one to review and accept reports relating to programs and activities of the church. Article two to discuss any matters of significance occurring since the annual meeting in May 2022. Article three, to review the status of the budget. Article four, to elect officers and members of boards and committees for the coming year. Article five, to transact any other business that may legally come before the meeting. And article six, to adjourn the meeting. Thank you, Sue. Um, are there any other announcements this morning that we need to mention before we begin worship? Any at all? If not... you all please join with me in this morning's call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 68. Sing to God, O nations of the earth, sing, sing praises to God. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies. May we stand and sing together hymn 199 in the pilgrim hymnal. Crown him with many crowns.
May we pray together. Let us pray. Holy One, Heavenly God, Sovereign God and Creator, we worship you. We give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, God's only begotten one, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Bless us as we gather to worship in your name. Amen. seated. As we draw together to worship today, we recognize as a part of our worship the need to give and to share as a part of sharing 
our faith with each other, and of course of sharing our resources and our faith with God. We would think about the need to always be aware of the need of giving and always would want to be able to give, but sometimes we have to have a way in which we can gather as one to um, bring our offerings together, to share our resources as part of God's community. This is that time as a part of our worship. The scriptures relate, give and it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, running over, for the measure you give will be the measure you receive. Each one must do as he or she has made up their mind to do, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And finally, I will not offer to the Lord my God that which has cost me nothing. Give and share as God has given and shared with you. At this time, may we have this morning's offering.
We give thanks, God, for the opportunity to give and to share of what you have given and shared with each of us. We give without compulsion, Lord, recognizing in our faith that we are to give and share of what we have. So bless these offerings, God, please, by your hand. May they be offered and shared with those in need, and may we be good stewards always of your resources. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. First reading, scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men in white, dressed in white, stood before him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew. Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with all his bro- and with his brothers. Second reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. In chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaming lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. This ends the reading. This morning's Gospel reading is taken from the Gospel according to John, the 17th chapter, verses 1 through 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people, 
to give eternal life to all whom you have given to him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you have given me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and that they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. May God add God's blessing upon the hearing and the reading of these words. We have some young people here today, some children, if they'd like to come down front for a few moments. Yes. Bingo. Yay. How are you guys doing? I missed you last week while I was away. Feeling good? Yeah. Feeling good? Oh, please, come on down. And we have, we've got plenty of room here. There's a chair here and a chair there, or you can sit on the, on the cushion. It's nice and soft. Welcome. Yeah, that's perfect. You want to sit in the little chair right there? You can't. It's wherever you want to sit. Doesn't matter. Good to see you all. So, one of the things I'm thinking about um, is where we all belong. Where we all belong. Now today, we belong in church. We've come to church to worship God. This is what we do on, on Sundays here at the South Parish Congregational Church. We've come to worship God, right, Ava? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah we've come to worship God. Um, but, but sometimes... There are times, at least I can say, that I'm not sure where I belong, you know? You know, I'm not sure where I'm supposed to be doing, or what I'm supposed to be saying, or things get kind of confusing in my life, and I'm not really sure exactly where, where I exactly belong. You ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that, have you ever felt that way, Ben? Yeah. Yeah, can you give me an example of a time you might have felt that way? Anybody? time when you're not sure where you belonged? Okay. Well, that's kind of hard unless it really happens. But it, it's kind of like these keys, and this is what I'm holding them for. I have all these keys, you know, and, and, it, and everybody kind of makes fun of me because I have all these keys. Because the thing is, is I'm not sure where all of them belong. You know, a key works by putting it into a lock, right? You have to have a lock. You put it in, right? And then you turn it, and then it might unlock, right? You've probably seen keys before. Oh, right, what's that? Or what? Or lock it. Yeah, or, or you go the other way. You can open it or you can lock it. But you, the, the thing about it is, the tricky thing about it is, is you've got to know what key goes to what lock, right? Because yeah. if you don't know that, well, it's not going to work, is it? And so I've got a lot of keys on here, a lot of keys on here. I'm not sure what they go to. That's kind of silly, isn't it? I mean, I know this one goes to my car, yeah. right? Because it's got that, right? It's got the big black thing on it, right? And, and I think there's another one here that, that could go to my office, but sometimes I can't remember which one that is. Uh, and I've got this gold key, and I am really not sure what that goes to. I think that used to go to a post office box I used to have a long time ago. So I've got all these keys, and I'm not sure what they belong to. 
And sometimes we kind of feel that way, right? You know, we're not really sure where we belong to or how important we are. You know, I mean, we can think about how we belong to our parents and people that love us, right? But one thing is for sure, and this is what I'd really like to tell you, okay? And this is really important. We all belong to God. We all belong to God. What do you think about that? Because, let me just say this too, God loves us very much. God loves you more than anything. More than anything. You know, when, he, when God made all the creation we read about, he looked out over all the different things and he said, boy, I like what I made. It's good. But then when he came to thinking about us, he said, we're very good. And God is said to have made us in God's image, which means that we're, in a sense, kind of come out of God's head. God formed us in a way that was very particular because he loved us so much. So one thing is for sure, no matter what you're doing, if you're out playing baseball in a field or if you're playing with your dolls at home or in your, with, your, with your little um, fish, yeah, your fishies or wherever you're playing with friends or family at school or playing with your stuffed animals. What's his name? Um, it's a Pokemon. It's an Evolve of Eevee, Umbreon. So if you're playing with uh, Umbreon? Yeah, it's a Pokemon. So if you're playing with your Pokemon, no matter what you're doing, no matter if you're alone or by yourself, you belong to God and God loves you and God will always take care of you. Because the things that we love, we take care of the most, don't we? And God loves you very much. We belong to God. Can we pray about that? That means we just kind of bow our heads and we just talk to God for a minute and maybe we could give a word of thanks for, for what God has done for us and, and how God loves us. We thank you today, God, that you love us so much. We thank you that you have put people in our lives like moms and dads and grandparents and, and other people in our lives that love us so much. But we want to remember today how much you love us and so much so that we really belong to you. And you will always be there to take care of us and to love us and to hold us. And we can always turn to you in our needs knowing that you're there. We thank you, God, that we belong to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You're all free to go to Sunday school if you'd like. Um, teacher is somewhere. Oh, there's Kathy. Kathy's right down there if you'd like to go with Kathy. I knew there had to be a use for all of these keys. I knew there had to be a use. Please remain seated and let's sing together hymn number 237. It is in your, um, the black hymnal, new century hymnal. I come to the garden alone. Most of us know it as in the garden.
May we pray together. We thank you, God, for this precious and holy time that we come together as your community, the church. And we thank you, God, for each person and the, each individual um, goodness that each person uh, shares here as we worship with you. Open us to new possibilities in the words that are shared and sung in Jesus' name. Amen. I was thinking this past week a little bit while I was away from you about my mom, as I believe last weekend was, was Mother's Day. I had a wonderful mother, a very caring person. She was not an overly affectionate mother. She wasn't someone that always came up and gave me a big kiss or even a big hug. Uh, but she was always there for me in very tangible and real ways, and particularly in times when I really needed to have someone beside me that loved me. My mother was always there. And so I thought about her a lot this past week. And I also thought about the fact that this was uh, Ascension Week, that is, the Ascension of Christ. What we celebrate in this beautiful window up here took place 40, 40 days after, after Easter. It's a marvelous piece of work. We always kind of, I always marvel at it. Other people I know do as well when they come in. The Ascension of Christ. But in thinking about the ascension as well as my mother, a lot of questions came to mind, you know? And I, and I thought about questions in this way. My parents, and particularly my mother, had a very favorite question she would ask of me. And you could probably guess by the nature of this question where she was going with it. She would always ask, when I was particularly looking a little guilty, or a, a little bit quizzing, uh, quizzical about things, she would say, Nate, what are you up to? What are you up to? You're up to something. What are you up to? What are you up to now? Sometimes she would say. No, something's going on. What are you up to now? And so I kind of thought about the ascension in that way, this week. Jesus, what are you up to now? You know, you, you see in this, this beautiful piece of stained glass that Jesus is floating. He's going up. He's going away. So what is Jesus up to? Well, in kind of thinking about this in different ways, I thought about the, something I read this past week as my time away in a book. Uh, it, it's a, called Murphy's Laws of Parenting. And Murphy's Law, of course, is the idea that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So these are some kinds of laws on how things can go wrong for moms or parents in general. And I think these to be true as well. And I think my two daughters that are here have learned that they're true as well now, that they're parents. So how about this one? Murphy's Law of Parenting. The later you stay up, the earlier a child will wake up the next morning. Have you noticed that, parents? <laughs> the gooier the food, the more likely it's going to end up on your plush carpet. Murphy's Law. Uh, and this, is, this one <laughs> makes me laugh because I was definitely guilty of this. The longer it takes you to make a meal, the less your child will like it. Very true. A sure way to get something done is to tell a child not to do it. Very true. For a child to become clean, something else must become dirty. That is an absolute rule. Absolute rule. Uh, backing the chair, uh, excuse me, backing the car out of the driveway causes your child to have to go to the bathroom. Every time I remember it with my kids. A child's greatest period of growth is a month after you've purchased new school clothes. Children seldom misquote you. In fact, they usually repeat word for word what you shouldn't have said. <laughs> These all sound really familiar to me. This understanding, you know, if things can go wrong, they'll go wrong. And in a weird way, I think this kind of relates to the, the Ascension story. And I think the disciples were kind of feeling that way a little bit. 
everything that kind of could have gone wrong during Jesus' time, those last times with him, uh, really kind of did go wrong. And, and especially in this moment here, you know, there was a sense that, well, Jesus is with us. Uh, he's come through the crucifixion. He's, he's risen. He showed himself to be who he is. And now all of a sudden, he's going to go away again. He's going to leave us again. And it really causes us now, in this day and age, in the church now, to really think about the ascension in very particular ways. That is, for example, the ascension means there can be no real neutrality about who Jesus is. I'm not sure if that's what the disciples were thinking. They were probably just in awe of what was happening and, and a lot of mixed emotion. But for us who look back at this, at this event, there's no neutrality about who Jesus was. We cannot simply pick and choose from his teachings. I really don't think we can. We, we really can't treat him because of this event like Socrates or Gandhi or Confucius, as wonderful as all those folks were, Jesus is very different. The ascension is the final proof, I think, that we are dealing with more than just a man. All the Bible says about who Jesus is makes little sense without this event. Through, through his ascent, we know that we're dealing with something very, very powerful and very different than us. We're dealing, in fact, with God. And the ascension is usually largely overshadowed by the incarnation and the resurrection. We have, we have big celebrations around these events, Christmas and Easter, big celebrations that we've come through over the last six months or so. But Ascension Day goes by without a trace. It went past, past this past week without a, without a trace of thought. And that's why I thought I'd really want to center in on it today. It's barely recognized. Yet it's no minor episode. A man by the name of Robert Ramsey. He said, Easter is incomplete, Pentecost is impeded, and the second coming is impossible without the event of the Ascension. Our Lord's ascension is a climatic and glorious event. And I believe that's why it's here. And a very prominent place here at the South Parish Church. And the Bible tells us this too, which makes it even more kind of mysterious and wonderful. The Bible tells us that Jesus ascended bodily. So this isn't just a, a kind of an artist rendition of Jesus' spirit heading back up into the sky. Oh no, the understanding here is that Jesus bodily, like you and I, bodily, ascended into heaven. Can you imagine what that would have been like to see? I mean, you don't really see flying men very often these days. Uh, cartoons, when I was growing up, there was Superman, you know, but he had a cape, and, and we kind of knew that that just wasn't really true. It was just kind of fun. But here is a, a really a cornerstone of our faith that includes a man uh, who really is God ascending bodily into heaven. And in any way you look at this, I think the most important way to look at this for us as people who are, are people of, a, of the need of care and love is that Jesus took to God the presence of his sacrificial death. He took his body, his own scarred and punctured and wounded and bloodied flesh, all of it he, he took with him into heaven. This is the image that I have. Just as the blood of the Jewish temple sacrifices were brought into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement in the Jewish tradition, and how those, the blood was sprinkled upon the Ark of the Covenant and recognizing the need for sacrifice to be visible to God, so Jesus ascended to heaven as both priest and as sacrifice alike. The book of Hebrews put it, puts it this way, through his own blood he entered the most holy place and with it he secured our salvation forever. His sacrifice was accepted and satisfied divine justice, which is really a kind of fancy way of, of God made it understood through Jesus' sacrifice exactly how much God loves us. Something I shared with the children today, right? That as we read that God was willing to sacrifice his only son for us. 
And on the other end of things, our Savior, as we understand, is received back at home, if you will, as a beloved son returning from a long and hard, 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 hazardous and, and awkward and difficult time on earth with God's people, but was finally being returned home to his father from this journey. So the ascension climaxes Jesus' earthly ministry, and it designates and demonstrates his lordship. It's a really important event that we need to always remember. On the day Jesus ascended to heaven, 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, his followers stood on the Mount of Olives grief-stricken. We can picture that, right? We've been in places where we've been grief-stricken. I think about the passing of my my parents when they died. Grief-stricken. His followers stood there grief-stricken. Their Easter joy seemed to be very short-lived. You know, Jesus was with them, now he's gone again. There he goes. And it took two angels, as the scriptures relate, to reassure the disciples that this was part of the eternal plan. This was part of their plan as his followers. Luke's gospel says that they returned after this with great joy. They were reassured, reassured themselves, and then found the joy in what was to come next. So the ascension proved to be a blessing as it prepared the disciples for the coming of Jesus' spiritual presence into their lives, which is something we'll be celebrating at Pentecost not long from now. And so this is the way I think about it. And I think this is the way they came to think about it as well. No longer was Jesus going to be confined to the limitations of time or even a plan and of a physical body. Jesus' spirit was going to come and live with them forever. St. Augustine had this beautiful prayer. And as a part of a prayer, he put what I just talked about this way. You ascended before our eyes. Jesus, you ascended before our eyes and we turned back grieving only to find you living in our hearts. Jesus is present in us wherever we go. As I mentioned to the children, as I'm saying to you now, Jesus is our companion, always with us. To me, that's, that's very satisfying and very important to my faith. Philip Yancey, and this is interesting, uh, he, he suggests that ever since the ascension, Jesus has sought other bodies in which to begin again the life he lived on earth. That's, that's you and I. He seeks us to, to live out his life now and in the present through us. But then there's this piece too, and I'd like to just touch upon this as well. Yancey also admits the ascension represents my greatest struggle of faith. Not whether it happened, but why? By ascending. Because by ascending, Jesus took the risk of being forgotten. Like the disciples really don't want Jesus to go. We feel detached from him. We're looking up into the blank sky, wishing Jesus were closer to home, closer with us. Even though we may not feel his presence, we are assured that he will never leave or forsake us, but yet we still miss it, that presence. The ascension is admittedly a struggle for us in times of trouble. That is, we really can't see Jesus, can we? We really can't sit down with him like we would a friend or a relative and talk. It's kind of a hard thing. So Jesus, excuse me, Yancey asked this question as well. He says, if Jesus could foresee such disasters as the Crusades, the Inquisition, the Christian slave trade, apartheid, 9-11, why did he ascend in the first place? Why couldn't he have just stayed here with us and we'd have no doubt where he was? And he goes on to say, I cannot provide a confident answer to such questions. And this is how he puts it for I am part of the problem. Yancey goes on to show how Christians have also brought light as well as darkness, and that's what he means. We brought a lot of problems upon ourselves and upon our world. But we've also 
brought to light things like working to end injustice, helping the poor and sick, promoting peace, and producing great art like this for the glory of God. But it is kind of troubling, isn't it? All the things that have happened since Jesus has been away. So what's the answer? Well, General Robert E. Lee said that one of the hardest things a commander can do as the commander of the southern armies during the Civil War, one of the hardest things to do as a commander is to send soldiers into battle knowing that they may be killed. He said it's like ordering the destruction of the thing you love the most. In essence, Jesus did just that on the day of ascension. He sent his disciples, ultimately sending us, to bring the good news to a hostile world where people would brutally oppose them in one way or another. But because he ascended, we know that our faith is something worth living for as well as dying for. Jesus continues to carry out his work in us. That's where he is. Thankfully, the bringing about of God's kingdom isn't totally up to us. The promised Holy Spirit, as we know, empowers us and gives us the ability to do things beyond our own scope or understanding. In a sense, uh, Jesus has left the keys to his kingdom in our hands, in each of our persons. So, as we understand from the scriptures, Jesus is deservedly now seated in the Holy of Holies at the right hand of God. But he's also, at least in part, with each of us. So, a great question of my mom. What, what is Jesus up to now? What is Jesus up to now? What's he doing? Well, he's working for us. He's working with us to preserve the things that he came to share with this world in each of us, in each of our hearts. We pray to the ascended Lord, thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. That's where we are right now. Jesus hears our prayers and I believe intercedes for us. Jesus responds to our prayers because we are, in fact, his flock, his sheep, his people. He is our mediator, our advocate. In Old Testament terms, our high priest. And this is important too. In my belief, I know this, there's a lot of talk of angels, but in Christ, I believe that we have the greatest representation of all. No angel could adequately represent each of us, but Jesus can. Calvin, he wrote, Jesus has entered into heaven in our flesh as if in our name. And so in a sense, as Paul writes, we are seated with God in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's a wonderful image to me. Jesus is available. We enjoy complete access to God. Jesus has an open door policy. You know, when I first came here, to South Parish, I kind of had an open door policy. So I come, how many knocks on the door, and they just come on in, and we talk. But it, it got to be a little bit too much. And so, although I don't ever refuse someone who comes to the door, I've really asked people to to make appointments because it's just so many people sometimes, and I can't keep it all straight. You know why I can't keep it all straight? Because I'm not Jesus. <laughs> I, I really can't do all that. But Jesus has the true open door policy. Any time, any place, He is available to us. He is with us. Our Lord's ascension assures that we too will be taken to heaven. That's the example. That's the model. You know, one of the best ways that we teach our children is through modeling. One of the best ways we teach anybody is through modeling. This is the model that we have in our faith in Christ. And he goes on to say, or at least during the times that he spent with his disciples before in John's Gospel, he says that he's preparing a place for us. Many people fear or obsess over death, yet we don't have to. Death is really no longer an issue. At least it shouldn't be. I know it can be scary. It can be hard to kind of wrap our heads around. But the ultimate truth of our faith is we don't have to fear death. Our eternal home is a settled promise. 
And Jesus is busy, busy about doing Jesus' thing, working to bring about his kingdom and his rule here on earth in preparation as we pray and think towards the future for some sort of his return. Jesus, who has been taken up from you in heaven, the author of Acts writes, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. I wonder what that will be like. In the meantime, we're waiting. We're being. We're worshiping. We're with Jesus in us and around us. And at the same time, we're experiencing pain and hardship and difficulty. And when we focus on our losses like the disciples of the day of ascension, we need to take a step back. We need to step back and look beyond our personal experiences and recognize that even in whatever we are experiencing in that moment, God through Christ is still with us. And we can seek what God wants us to have always in our faith. And that's hope. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer, I would draw your attention to um, the prayer requests in the back of your bulletins this morning. We've kind of started a new list, more or less. We pray for the Kumler family. We continue to pray for Maddie and the people of Ukraine, for Stephanie and Diane, for Maria and those seeking shelter or a home. It's a part of our church mission. We pray for our brothers and sisters at the Green Street Methodist Church, for Sue and Mal Leary, for Paul and his family, for Nancy, for Linda Brown, and I've been asked to pray as well for, for Donna and for Burley Martin. And I would just like to ask if there are others to pray for today. Please, Sue. Okay, I got, I got to hear you. Church meeting? G7, right, I got you. So we're praying for Lynn, we're praying for the, the, the world's leaders who are meeting in this very important and very powerful meeting, G7 meeting. Are there any others to pray for? If not, let us come together in a few moments of silence and let us pray together. God of the past, God of the present, God of the future, precious and loving God who loves us more than anything, whose power and love is responsible for all that is and all that ever will be, we come to you humbly today in worship, seeking your presence, finding your spirit, and recognizing you within each of us. We praise you and thank you for our world and our lives and the opportunities that you've given to each of us to share and be a part of the gospel. As you have breathed life and breath into us, we have that spirit which can overcome even the most difficult of times and moments and tragedies as we look towards your love and grace that is forever a part of our lives. Oh God, help us to always appreciate all of your creations, remembering that we are not owners of really anything that you have provided for us, only caretakers. So we would pray to be good stewards of your world, good stewards of our friends and neighbors in love and care, good stewards of our own bodies, good stewards of our families and our communities. We have received so many blessings from you, Lord, and we at this time thank you for them. You have touched all of our lives in so many ways, and we pray for the continuance of your spirit working in our lives, particularly for the benefit of others. As we think of others, we think of the names that have been shared this morning, openly. We think of Lynn, we think of the world leaders and 
those who are in power on this earth, and we pray for your guiding presence for them. But we also pray for ourselves. We pray that we would grow in our faith and that with your help it would be nurtured and that it would overcome the obstacles of this life that would prevent us from seeking and finding your love in others and, of course, in and through Jesus Christ. And so it is in Christ's name that we ask all these things with the assurance that God answers our prayers and that in Jesus we might find strength to face all the difficulties that we may encounter. And it's in that way that we remember Christ's words who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May we close today's service of worship by standing and singing together hymn number 404 in the Pilgrim Hymnal, Take My Life and Let It Be. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, for those of you who are staying for the meeting, and I hope you all do, whether or not you're a member or not, you're certainly welcome. Uh, please stay seated and stay here. Um, but may God's blessing, no matter where you are, continue to be upon you and in your heart. Go today into the world when we eventually leave here with peace in your heart and in your mind, willing to share and to give of yourself all in the very name of Jesus Christ, who loves you. Amen.